Dr. Michael Brown is the president of the Fire School of Ministry in Concord, North Carolina. He's also the host of a daily, nationally, and um, talk radio show, The Line of Fire, as well as the host of the documentary TV series, Thinking Through, discussing historical, biblical, religious, Jewish, and Christian subjections. Dr. Brown holds a PhD in Near Eastern languages and literature from New York University, and is a scholar of the Hebrew Bible. He has contributed numerous articles to scholarly publications, such as Oxford Dictionary of Jewish Religion and the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. He is also author of about 20 books, including Our Hands Are Stained with Blood, The Tragic Story of the Church and the Jewish People, and the highly acclaimed, acclaimed five-volume series, Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus. Dr. Brown is a national and international speaker. He has debates, he debated Jewish rabbis, agnostics professors, and gay activists on radio, TV, and college campuses. We would have loved to have con um, conducted this presentation in debate um, from any qualified rabbi, but unfortunately, every invitation was declined. Um, even one said he would like to do that, but he didn't get permission from his mm -hmm. rabbi, so that's why only Dr. Brown is speaking, and there's nobody to respond to his claims. Now, from scholarly, messianic, and Jewish perspective, Dr. Brown will raise the question, Jesus in the Jewish tradition, is Jesus appears in the Jewish tradition. Um, I have to read this because there are so many things, so I won't miss anything. Um, so now, we have firmer talkings from me. Please welcome Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for uh, coming out tonight. It's wonderful to be with all of you. Uh, when I was studying at NYU, we had a couple of visiting professors over from Hebrew University and phenomenal classes with them. So I have great esteem for the scholarship here and glad to have this time with you. So again, I'm glad that you're here, whatever your perspective is. If you agree, if you're seeking, if you're here to differ, that's, that's all perfectly fine. And uh, I won't be talking too long initially, it won't be like an hour or two hour lecture or something, because we want to give time for questions. So uh, the other thing is, uh, it's good you have your phones turned off, but you're perfectly free to record this however you want, or put it on Facebook or YouTube, or try to have me talking backwards or something to make it look silly, but I trust your integrity uh, in that. So first let me just give you a little bit about my own background as a believer in Jesus, believer in Yeshua. I was born in New York City, raised on Long Island, and my dad was the senior lawyer in the New York Supreme Court, and my upbringing was conservative Jewish. So it was kind of wishy-washy, not real serious Judaism. It's the only Judaism I knew growing up, growing up. So I was bar mitzvah at 13, but it was more of a social event. The bigger event for me when I was 13 was going to my first rock concert, seeing Jimi Hendrix perform in New York City. And I was playing drums. I got really interested in the whole rock culture. I started to grow my hair long, and, and it's kind of funny to look back at now. And uh, I started getting high when I was 14 years old. I wasn't, I wasn't searching for anything. I wasn't on a spiritual journey. I just got into the whole rock culture, the whole rebellious scene of the late 60s and early 70s. We call it the counterculture revolution. It was just kind of in the air. By the time I was 15, I was shooting heroin, and uh, very decadent, very rebellious, very proud young person, even to my shame, stole money from my own father. And at the age of 16, two of my friends, Gentile friends, became believers in Jesus, along with some of their uh, other friends, girlfriends. I went to pull them out of the place where they were. Uh, in fact, the first church service I attended, it was totally foreign to me, I'd never been in the church. The first service I attended, one young lady who knew me uh, from high school wrote down in her diary, Antichrist comes to church. And uh, years later, my wife, my wife Nancy, uh, also a Jewish believer in Yeshua, she saw a picture of me with my long hair in my rebellious days, and she started laughing. I said, you're laughing because I look like a woman. She said, no, I'm laughing because you look like an ugly woman. So uh, and anyway, that was kind of an, an outward picture of a very corrupt inward soul. By the end of that year, I really met God. He, he dramatically changed my life. Uh, I, I had believed that God existed, but in, in no way that impacted me. But I really encountered him. And, and I really came to believe 
that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. It may have sounded foreign to a Jewish person, but it was very real to me. And, and in a matter of days, I was completely transformed. Uh, I mean, drugs and all that stuff just went overnight. I was transformed. My dad was thrilled to see the change in my life because my parents were concerned because of my drug use, rightly so. And my dad said, okay, great. Uh, now it's early 1972. I've been a believer in, in Jesus for a few weeks. My dad said, it's wonderful you're off drugs, but now you need to talk to the rabbi. You know, you need to come back to Judaism. So the rabbi and I began to talk. Conservative rabbi had graduated from Jewish Theological Seminary. We had wonderful interaction. And I started to study scripture more and more and more. I, by the time I was 18, I'd read through the Bible in English five times. I used to memorize 20 verses every day. I mean, I was just immersed in this, but I didn't know any Hebrew. The little Hebrew I learned on the way to bar, uh, my bar mitzvah, I'd completely forgotten at that point. So the rabbi would always challenge me, you don't know Hebrew, which was a fair challenge. I mean, I'm telling him what the Bible says. I can't even read it in Hebrew. And he said, Mike, here's the issue. We are both spiritually minded men, but you are more spiritually minded than I am. He said, if we were both Buddhists, you would be a more religious Buddhist than me. He said, so you need to meet Jews who are just as spiritual as you are, except they're right. He said, Mike, your spirituality is misguided. So when I was 18 years old, he took me to meet some ultra-Orthodox rabbis in New York City, Hasidic rabbis, Lubavitch rabbis. Uh, they worked in a counter-missionary way. In other words, they were used to dealing with people like me. Very, very nice guys, very kind, gentle towards me. And we sat for hours, and we'd open the scripture, and I'd quote something to them in English, and, and, and they said, oh, those English translations. And they, they weren't being nasty. They said, can you read the Hebrew? Well, I mean, I'd forgotten just about everything. I remembered some letters. They said, look, look, we'll show you. They're going kind of letter by letter. So now, now I feel like a, a little child sitting there. We spent hours together, and then I met with them other hours, even spent a Yom Kippur with them. David Tolman the whole day and night with them and interacted with them and many other rabbis. And along the way, when I started college, uh, I, in fact, I went to college only to honor my parents because I still had the hippie mentality that you don't need formal education. So I went to honor my parents and started to get into studies, started taking Hebrew and Arabic and other languages and, and then decided, look, I, I've got to study in such a way that I don't have to depend on anyone else's opinion. It doesn't mean you're always right, but just study so you can use the original sources clearly enough that you can think for yourself. So I knew the experience that I had with God was real. I knew it in an ongoing way. I, I really knew him as, as father in a deep, intimate way. But I wanted to have intellectual answers for the challenges that I was getting from the rabbis and the Jewish community. So uh, along the way, I just fell in love with scholarship and studies. So that, that led to my studies at NYU. And uh, that's just the intro in terms of where I am, how I got here. And the reason that I wrote all these books on answering Jewish objections to Jesus and debated rabbis was because I was challenged. When I would talk to them, they would challenge me and, and then challenge what we knew. So my whole thing is let's lay it out and have a good discussion. That's why I love to have public debates. It's not, it's not to win an argument. It's to say, look, you need to hear both sides. That's why folks made an effort to get a rabbi to debate me for whatever reason they weren't willing. That's, that's perfectly fine. But I love people to hear both sides. I, I love... Look at both sides, pray, study, think it through, and, and come to a, to a right conclusion. What I want to address tonight, first, some of the Jewish perceptions about Jesus, and then open up some aspects of Jewish tradition that some Jews are not aware of. Many Christians, I would say, the vast majority of Christians are not aware of. But these traditions are a potential path within Judaism to open up Jewish minds and hearts to the fact that Yeshua is the Messiah. It's a fascinating thing if you'll talk to your average Israeli about Yeshua. First, there's the communication issue because if, if you say Yeshua, his proper Hebrew name, they're not familiar with that. They're familiar with the rabbinic way of saying it, which is Yeshu. And in Jewish thought, traditional Jewish thought, that's short for Yimach Shmo V'Zichro, may his name and memory perish. It's a, it's a derogatory name based on a, a later pronunciation of it. So they don't know who you're talking about. When they find out who you're talking about, the average feeling is, well, that's not for us. That's for the Goyim. That's for the Gentiles. That's, that, that's an outside religion, which is amazingly ironic when you think about it. I mean, you're, you're talking about the first man in recorded history who was called rabbi, 
right? He, he, he was not a reverend. He was a rabbi. You understand that, right? He, he was not the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ. We're clear on that here at Hebrew University, right? So he was called Christ because he was considered to be Messiah. This is the Greek way of saying Messiah. That, that's so foreign to most people. They, they just think of him as somehow part of a foreign religion. He lived his entire life in the land. He made clear, I didn't come to abolish the Torah of the prophets, but to fulfill. And yet, your average Jewish person today, your average person living in Israel, thinks of him as foreign, the head of a foreign religion, something that's not for Jews. I mean, you, you, you realize his, his first Talmudim, his first followers, disciples, were Jewish men with names like, like Yaakov and, and Yehuda and Yochanan. And, and his whole message was to Jewish people. And in fact, the big controversy, the big controversy in the early Messianic assembly, which we later come to know as church, which can be a misleading term, but the early Messianic assembly, you know what the big controversy was? Can you be a Gentile and believe in Yeshua, or must you become Jewish? Must you convert to Judaism? Because after all, he's the Jewish Messiah. That got so twisted through the ages that the question became, can you be a Jew and believe in Jesus? I have friends of mine, Jewish friends, that when they came to faith in Yeshua's Messiah, Someone in the church gave them a, a sandwich with bacon or pork or something to, to see if they were really, quote, saved. I mean, that's how bizarre the thing has got. In the Middle Ages, there would be baptismal formulas that, that people would have to say before being baptized into Catholicism, a Jew being baptized into Catholicism, where they would have to renounce, utterly renounce any connection to their Jewish people, Jewish heritage, Sabbath, circumcision, anything and said that they would worship Mary. You're talking about insanity. That's what a lot of Jews have known through history. Hence, in their mind, Jesus is not one of us. He's the head of this foreign religion. It's not surprising because of organized church persecution of Jews at different times in history. It's, it's obviously not true followers of Yeshua that would do this, but organized, quote, Christian persecution of Jews. Jews being told be baptized or die, the Crusades, Inquisitions, and things like that. It's not surprising that over the centuries, there's literature that has risen up which is totally hostile towards Yeshua. In, in Talmudic writings, Midrashic writings, there's a debate, a lively debate about which of these actually refer to him. Sometimes he's referred to in a code name. Does Jewish tradition actually say this and this about him? There's no question. There are some writings totally hostile to him making him out to be an idolater, making him out to be the worst blasphemer. And I understand where it comes from. There was a hostility against Jesus, and, and it got inflamed as, as the so-called church, supposedly his followers, persecuted Jews in his name. Uh, so I, I understand why there is Jewish hostility, why there's Jewish animosity, why there's the concept that Jesus is not for us. What, what I want to talk about, take a few more minutes, is to focus on this. There are Jewish traditions that, if rightly understood, open up the heart of the gospel message. As I've been walking around the city here in different parts of Israel in the few days I've been here, and of course many other trips and many hundreds and hundreds of hours interacting with rabbis, ultra-Orthodox rabbis and different ones. Some I talk to once a week by phone. We interact and have intensive discussion. I am not looking for traditional Jews or secular Jews to leave their Jewishness and join a foreign religion. That's not the goal. The goal is to help them recognize Yeshua as our promised Messiah. But here's a problem. How could he be the promised Messiah when the central message is that he died on a cross. I mean, what a foreign concept. Isn't that human sacrifice? So, somebody dying for us? What about repentance? What about the responsibility of others? How, how can that message in any way be considered Jewish? And, and then the idea that, that the Messiah could be divine or that God is triune or as I, I like to say, complex in his unity. How can that possibly be a Jewish concept? Now, it's interesting, there's a professor at Jewish Theological Seminary, Professor Benjamin Sommer, and he's written a book uh, recently called The Bodies of God, looking at ancient and Eastern tradition about different deities and, and having physical bodies, and then looking at the Hebrew text, the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, looking at the witness of that, and then looking at Jewish tradition, and he wrote something very interesting. I want to quote this. This is Professor at Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. 
This study, he's talking about his book, forces a reevaluation of a common Jewish attitude toward Christianity. Some Jews regard Christianity's claim to be a monotheistic religion with grave suspicion, both because of the doctrine of the Trinity, how can three equal one, and because of Christianity's core belief that God took bodily form. Look at what he says. No Jew sensitive to Judaism's own classical sources, however, can fault the theological model Christianity employs when it avows belief in a God who has an earthly body as well as a Holy Spirit and a heavenly manifestation. For that model, we have seen, is a perfectly Jewish one. Say, so when you read the Hebrew scriptures rightly and, and understand Jewish tradition, there's nothing un-Jewish about this. He says this, speaking of Judaism, a religion whose scripture contains the fluidity traditions, talking about God appearing in human form and manifesting himself in different ways, whose teachings emphasize the multiplicity of the Shekhinah, the Shekhinah being the divine presence on earth, and whose thinkers speak of the Sfirot, the ten emanations that the mystics speak of from God so that the invisible transcendent God can touch human beings. That religion does not differ in its theological essentials from a religion that adores the triune God. Note that the Christian beliefs that Judaism rejects are not specifically theological in nature. So he's saying this, and I argued this in volume two of my series answering Jewish objections to Jesus, that when we rightly understand the teaching of the complex unity of God and the divine nature of the Messiah, we find it as thoroughly biblical. I can demonstrate it to you using the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures alone. And we find it in harmony with various Jewish traditions that speak of the infinite nature of God. But what about, what about this whole idea that the Messiah dies on a cross for the sins of the world? You've got to be kidding me. That's supposed to be Jewish? I remember as a kid growing, in the, growing up in New York City, uh, taking the, the subway, the underground train with my dad sometimes, I would see written on the wall the words, Jesus saves. It, it had zero meaning. To me. What does it mean, Jesus saves? Uh, there was a Jewish joke, a counter joke to that, that Jesus saves, Moses invests. <laughs> and uh, there, there, was even, there was even a counter joke to it for those that are familiar with, with with hockey, although there'd be parallels with football, soccer. You know, if, the, if a shot comes and the goalie stops it, he, he's made a save, right? And there was a famous hockey player in Boston named Phil Esposito. There was actually bumper stickers making fun of this. Jesus saves, Esposito scores on the rebound. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, it's just meaningless word. Jesus saves, what in the world is that talking about? Then when I became a believer in 1971, it was wonderful and incredible. And, but is it Jewish? So, uh, I want to open up some fascinating Jewish traditions to you. And then after that, we'll have a time for questions. I, I want to make clear that the rabbis that taught these things over the centuries were not secret believers in Yeshua. That's, that's not what I'm intimating. What I'm saying is this idea of the righteous one dying on the cross, dying a criminal's death, that was the whole thing of the cross. It was not a Christian way of death. It was a publicly humiliating way of death for the worst of criminals and rebels. It, it was such a horrific way of, of killing people that the Romans, who were known for anything but their great humanity and, and hatred of suffering, the Romans ultimately outlawed it as a, as a method of death. But what I want to show you is this concept of the perfectly righteous one dying to make atonement for the sins of others so that join with their repentance, there can be forgiveness of sins, is a thoroughly Jewish concept. Let me just read a couple of quotes to you. I'm not trying to show off a gadget, but I just wasn't <laughs> unable to print things up today, so hence I put them on this cool little gadget. Now, I'm actually a representative for this. I'm here to sell these ones. <laughs> Only kidding. All right, this is highly respected Orthodox Jewish rabbi and historian Beryl Wine in his book, Triumph of Survival. Listen carefully to what he says. Another consideration tinged the Jewish response to the slaughter of its people. It was an old Jewish tradition dating back to biblical times that the death of the righteous and innocent served as an expiation for the sins of the nation or the world. This is Orthodox Jewish rabbi writing. The stories of Isaac, talking about the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, where in Jewish tradition it was as if he died, 
And of Nadav and Avihu, the two oldest sons of Aaron, who died when they offered up unauthorized incense, unauthorized fire, and Jewish tradition regards them as righteous, godly men. The stories of Isaac and of Nadav and Avihu, the prophetic description of Israel as the long-suffering servant of the Lord, the sacrificial service in the temple, all served to reinforce this basic concept of the death of the righteous as an atonement for the sins of other men. Thus says Orthodox Jewish Rabbi Beryl Wein. Jews nurtured this classic idea of death as an atonement, he writes. And this attitude toward their own tragedies was their constant companion through their turbulent exile. Therefore, the holy, bleak picture of unreasoning slaughter was somewhat relieved by the fact that the innocent did not die in vain and that the betterment of Israel and humankind somehow was advanced by their stretching their neck to be slaughtered. The spirit of the Jews is truly reflected in the historical chronicle of the time called Yevon Mitzulah, talking about suffering of the Jewish people about 400 years ago. Quote, would the Holy One, blessed be he, dispense judgment without justice? But we may say that whom God loves will be chastised. For since the day the holy temple was destroyed, the righteous are seized by death for the iniquities of the generation. What a concept. Let me try to shed a little light on that. First, Rabbi Wine is explaining what gave courage to Jews in the midst of their suffering and pain, that it wasn't all in vain, because it looked often like the best of them were dying. What was the purpose of it? Mm -hmm. So somehow, there had to be a redemptive meaning from it. And looking back at scripture and other aspects of Jewish tradition, they had an answer. The death of the righteous atones. Well, what does that mean? Think of it like this. You have an account in Numbers, the 25th chapter, the children of Israel are worshiping idols and committing sexual sin. Judgment has fallen on the people of Israel. And one Israelite man with a foreign woman, a Moabite woman, goes into his tent brazenly. Everybody's weeping in repentance. And he goes in with a foreign woman. Obviously, they have sexual relations with her in his tent. Zimri and Cosby, their names. And Pinchas, Phineas, the priest, goes running in to the tent it's a famous account, and sticks a spear through both of them, spears them both to the wall and kills them. And the plague stops. And remarkably, it says, he made atonement for Israel. He made atonement for Israel? God doesn't want human blood. What does it mean? Well, representative ringleaders, representative guilty ones were put to death, and that representative punishment sufficed for God to judge everyone. Now, let's look at it from a different angle. Let's say that you are part of a Hasidic sect that reveres your Rebbe, reveres your grand rabbi. His life would be held in, in so much value by the community. Let's say that someone was going to wipe out the entire community and he said, take my life instead. Someone might be willing to kill him as someone considered to be a representative righteous leader and let everyone else go free. His, his life would carry more weight. You also have the issue of what looks like innocent suffering. Why do children suffer? The sweetest little kid dies of leukemia. What happened? Family dies in an earthquake, and, and they were the godliest family community. What happened? Righteous rabbi killed in the Holocaust. One Hasidic rabbi, Rabbi Klinberg, when, he, when he's about to be killed by the Nazis, he cries out, let my death be an atonement. See, there's this concept of, of innocent suffering somehow countering things in the balance, at least delaying punishment or putting punishment off or even providing healing. The passage, one of the passages mentioned by Rabbi Wine is the, the suffering servant. This is constantly quoted by followers of Yeshua, Isaiah 53 and other passages that speak of one suffering, not for his own sins, but for the sins of others. Rabbi Wine said, that gives us an understanding of this concept that the death of the righteous atones. He said it refers to Israel. I would say it refers to the ideal representative of Israel, the one who fulfills Israel's mission, the Messiah, Yeshua. Just, just look at some of the verses in Isaiah 53 against this backdrop that the death of the righteous atones. Surely he took up our infirmities, carried our sorrows. We considered him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted. 
And he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds were healed. I mean, this really sounds like someone dying innocently that we can be healed, made whole. It's not just that innocent people suffer and die, but their suffering somehow produces healing for others. Kulanu katzon ta'inu, all of us like sheep have gone astray, each the dark hope, each one's turned to his own way. But the Lord's laid upon him the iniquity of all of us. Just quoting select verses from Isaiah 53. I always love to quote these, meditate on. For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people, negalamo, a stroke for them. He suffers for them. He made himself an offering for guilt. The servant of the Lord becomes an asham, a guilt offering. The one offering in the Torah that could actually atone for certain specific intentional sins. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. He'll bear their iniquities because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, chet rabim nasa, and made intercession for the transgressors. This is a picture clearly laid out in scripture. It's not just laid out in scripture, it's laid out in Jewish tradition. Could it be that this message, which is considered to be so un-Jewish, so foreign, is actually planted right within our own tradition, the atoning power of the death of the righteous? Let, let me give you some more texts. The Talmud, Talmud Bavli, Moed Katan, 28a, teaches, the death of the righteous atones. There's a well-known discussion there. Moed Katan, 28a. The Talmud asks why the book of Numbers records the death of Miriam immediately after the section on the red heifer, which is Numbers 19, through the beginning of 20. The answer is, just as the red heifer atones, so also the death of the righteous atones. The, why, the Talmud asks, is the death of Aaron recorded in conjunction with the Torah's reference to the priestly garments, Numbers 20. The answer is, just as the garments of the high priest atone, so also the death of the righteous atone. Here's another text, Leviticus Rabbah, so Midrash Rabbah to Leviticus 20, 12, and then several other locations. Rabbi Chiyabar Abba said, the sons of Aaron, Nadav and Avi, who died the first day of Nisan. Why then does the Torah mention their death in conjunction with the Day of Atonement, which occurred on the 10th of Tishrei? It is to teach that just as the Day of Atonement atones, so also the death of the righteous atones. There's a well-known discussion in the Talmud in Mishnah Makot 2.6 and then Talmud Bavli, uh, Makot 11b, other sources as well. Do you remember Numbers, the 35th chapter? It says that there is no atonement for bloodshed. If you take someone's blood, then your blood has to be taken because bloodshed defiles the land. Life for life has to be balanced out. What if you accidentally kill someone? Then there was a provision, cities of refuge. You could take refuge in one of those cities because it was an accident. And, and if someone from the family was trying to take vengeance and kill you, they couldn't do it. How long did you have to stay in the city of refuge? Was there a place where you could get out? Was there a time you could get out? Yes, when the high priest died. When the high priest died, someone who had shed blood could be released from the city of refuge if they were there, of course, because they were innocent. It was an accident when they shed someone's blood. So the Talmud asked the question, isn't it the exile of the innocent manslayer in the city of refuge that atones, that expiates? In other words, he spent his time there. Isn't that what atones for his sins, what expiates? The answer is no, it is not the exile that expiates, but the death of the high priest. Because he, as the righteous representative of the nation, he as the God-appointed intercessor, had the spiritual responsibility of interceding for the sins of the nation and bearing them before God for atonement. So when he died, his death could bring expiation even for bloodshed. So one or two more texts and then we'll stop and take questions. The Zohar is dealing with a, a verse in Ecclesiastes that here's someone that's evil and it seems to go well for that person and here's someone that's good and it goes badly for that person. How is that to be explained? So Zohar, Jewish mysticism, says this, the children of the world are members of one another just like the physical body joined together. And when the Holy One desires to give healing to the world, he smites one just man amongst them, and for his sake heals all the rest. Whence do we learn this? From the saying, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, Isaiah 53, we just read. That is by the letting of his blood, 
as when a man bleeds his arm, there was healing for us, for all the members of the body. In general, a just person is only smitten in order to procure healing and atonement for a whole generation. There is a practice in the ancient world and still common in parts of the world that if you have a physical illness, you've got bad blood of some kind. So you have to let the blood, you have to bleed the person, get rid of the bad blood. That's what the Zohar is talking about. You take a healthy arm, right, and you cut it for the bad blood to get out. Why? To heal the whole body. That's why sometimes in this Jewish thought, the righteous will suffer to bring healing to the whole generation. Now, listen to this text. It's from the New Testament, written by a Jewish man, Shimon Kepha, known to most of the world as Peter, Simon Peter. Listen to this and you realize, well, oh, this is not some foreign Christian message. This is something laid out in Tanakh. And this is something in keeping with later Jewish tradition. When they hurled insults at him, at Messiah, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. I mentioned a few minutes ago that Jewish tradition looks at the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, as if he had actually died. It even talks about him shedding his blood. It even talks about some Jewish tradition, speaks about all of the sacrifices that are offered have merit because of the, quote, blood of Isaac, even though he never shed his blood. God delivered him from death. But Jewish tradition puts great emphasis on his willingness. In fact, in Jewish tradition, he's a man in his late 30s. He's not a little boy. And he willingly lays down on the altar to be sacrificed. So one of the Targums, one of the ancient paraphrastic translations of the Torah puts this prayer in the mouth of Abraham. Genesis 22, and he's about to sacrifice Isaac. Now I pray for mercy before you, O Lord, that when the children of Isaac come to a time of distress, you may remember on their behalf the binding of Isaac, their father, and loose and forgive them their sins and deliver them from all distress based on what Isaac suffered. There's a New Year prayer of Talmudic rabbi uh, Bibi Bar Abba. So when the children of Israel commit sin and do evil, remember on their behalf the binding of Isaac and full of compassion towards them, be merciful to them. So somehow the weight of his sacrifice can procure merit so if people will turn to God in repentance, they can receive forgiveness. Of course, Isaac never died. And of course, he was not perfectly righteous. And the requirement of a sacrifice was that it had to be perfect without blemish. Hence our emphasis on the sinless nature of Messiah and him being the only one that could rightly bear the sins of the world. So as people put their faith in God through him and repent of sin, they can be forgiven. There, there are many, many, many other Jewish texts that go in the same direction. Uh, a couple of other relevant quotes from Zohar, as long as Israel dwelt in the Holy Land, the rituals and the sacrifices they performed in the temple removed all those diseases from the world. Now the Messiah removes them from the children of the world. And from Exodus Rabbah, so Midrash, Midrash to Exodus, Truma 35.4, Moses said to God, will not the time come when Israel shall have neither tabernacle nor temple? What will happen with them then? The divine reply was, I will then take one of their righteous men and keep him as a pledge on their behalf so that I may pardon or atone for all their sins. So the point I'm making is simple. To repeat, it's not that I'm saying the Talmudic rabbis or the authors of the Midrashim or these other texts or the, the author of Zohar or other Jewish writers secretly believed the gospel. No, I'm saying that one of the fundamental truths, one of the fundamental messianic truths, one of the fundamental truths about Jesus, Yeshua, that he died for the sins of the world is very much grounded not only in scripture, but also in harmony with Jewish tradition. I'm not expecting all the rabbis and the Haredim and the, the Datim of the communities and Israelis from every background and Jews from every background to leave being Jewish to follow some foreign God. I'm looking for them to recognize Yeshua the Messiah as one of us, one of our people, right in our own midst, the promised one, the deliverer. Last point, I mentioned repentance a few times. 
sometimes when I'm debating rabbis, they will have a mistaken understanding of what the New Testament teaches, as if it teaches all you do is just make a profession of faith, say, I believe in Jesus, something like that. And then your life doesn't change. You go on the way you are. You can live the most wicked life, but he, you said the magic words, you get in. That's a foreign concept to the New Testament. God pronounces us just when we turn to him and ask him for mercy. The mercy we're asking is to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us, to wash us. So throughout the, 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 the New Testament, the first word of the message, the Besorah, the good news, the gospel, is repent. Turn from your sins, turn to God, he'll have mercy on you. I mean, just take any concordance, whatever language you're reading in, or if, if you're reading it in, in Greek, any of the, the words re relating to metanoia, metanael. Repent, repent, repent. It was the message of John the Immerser, who was the forerunner of Mashiach. It was the message of Yeshua himself. It was the message of his Talmudim over and over and over and over. You find it all through what's called the book of Acts on the lips of, of Peter, on the lips of Paul, Shaul, over and over and over. The difference is that because of Messiah's death and resurrection and the giving of the Holy Spirit, we have power from God to change. It's not just a matter of trying harder, doing our best. Something supernatural happens. Just like December 17th, 71, for me here, shooting heroin, heavy drug user, worst drug user in my high school, craziest, encountering God's love and goodness. I said, I'll never put a needle in my arm again. That was it, free from that day on. We're, we're talking about the power and life of the Spirit. And all of this, I would say, I can argue, point out, prove, demonstrate using Hebrew Scripture alone. And then, of course, confirmed in the writings of, of the New Covenant. And then from there even in harmony with much Jewish tradition, rightly understood. The atoning power of the death of the righteous, a key to understand the mission of Messiah. Okay, let's do this. Uh, if you have questions that you'd like to ask, they can be uh, friendly or hostile. They can just be curious. As, as long as they relate somehow to what I'm talking about or what I believe. If it's completely random, Maybe we can chat afterwards, or you can call my live radio show one day and ask a random question, okay? Uh, but the goal is to keep it in harmony with the general issue of the Messiahship of Jesus, uh, any things I've talked about. If you want to dispute a text I've used, if you want to take issue with anything, uh, please do it. But here's what we need you to do. Uh, you may have an amazing, wonderful story and an incredible family, but we don't have time to hear about all that, okay? Uh, we, you may have, it's, it may be like a miracle that you're even here tonight. That's tremendous, but we don't have time to hear. What we need to hear is the question, all right? So if there's a statement you need to make to back up the question, just do it succinctly so we can be fair to others. But we need folks to stand over here, or what's, what's the plan? Or we'll just have, stand up where they are? No, no, we'll have you guys come up to about this spot right here with the red All right. chairs. And uh, I'll put the camera on you. If you don't want to be on camera, just say you don't want to be on camera. If you want to be on camera, ask a question. And uh, as long as you're at this spot right here, okay? Right, so I, I know it's a little hard for people to step out. So if, you, if you'd like to ask questions uh, of any kind, then just, uh, just need to stand up, get a line over here, and we'll call on you one at a time, all right? And ask as loudly as you can so everyone can hear it, and then I'll, I'll repeat it quickly to make sure that we're on track. Uh, yes, sir? Just a very quick question. I was curious which Targum you were quoting with the prayer concerning the death of Isaac. Uh, I believe that's uh, Targum the Ephidi. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, I, I understand we're supposed to identify as an agreement or disagreement. No, no, I'll oh, okay. figure that out from the question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here out of sheer curiosity. I was wondering. You quoted a lot of uh, passages about how the idea of vicarious redemption is, is not foreign at all to Judaism. I know that a, a usual counter-argument from, from the Jewish side is that, well, maybe that is true, but there are all these prophecies that Jesus was supposed to have satisfied and yet he didn't. Uh, so are there any passages that you could provide that reinforce this notion that there's going to be a, a second or after that might even be a third coming? Okay, great. So, so the simple question would be, even if I could demonstrate that the idea that the, the death of the Messiah for the sins of the world is in harmony with Jewish tradition, is not a foreign concept, and is grounded in scripture, okay, 
that's fine, but he's still not the Messiah because he didn't fulfill the Messianic prophecies. He didn't regather the exiles. He didn't rebuild the temple. He didn't put an end to war. He didn't establish universal peace. He's obviously not the Messiah. Look around at the earth. We've had all this war, bloodshed, poverty, suffering, a false religion, everything, people killing each other in the name of God. If he was the Messiah, this wouldn't have happened. So that would be the force of the argument. Uh, the, the answer is, is very simple. Namely, there were certain prophecies that had to be fulfilled before the second temple was destroyed. That's the first thing. And secondly, when we rightly understand the prophecies, we see first Messiah had to suffer before being exalted. First suffer, die, and even be rejected before bringing about the universal reign of God on the earth. And we're in a transition age right now since he died and rose until he returns. So can I back that up scripturally? First point, certain prophecies had to be fulfilled before the second temple was destroyed. Uh, there's a threefold cord of witness that I always point to. Haggai, the second chapter, when the second temple had been rebuilt and it was only a shadow of Solomon's temple, the prophetic word was given that the glory of the second temple would be greater than the glory of the first temple. God would refurbish its silver, gold, and all that, but the glory would be greater. God said, I'll fill this place with glory. And when that's used with reference to the temple, it's quite explicit. It's talking about the presence of God. You can look in Exodus 40 and, and 2 Chronicles 7 and, and other passages. So how was the, the glory of the second temple greater than the glory of the first temple? The Talmudic rabbis acknowledged the Shekhinah wasn't there, the divine fire wasn't there, you didn't have the, the Ten Commandments there in the, in the ark. How was it greater? Question number one. Malachi, the third chapter, it says that God will visit the second temple, that he will come suddenly and bring purging, cleansing to the second temple. When did that happen? Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27, passage with lots of controversy, but it tells us clearly before the second temple is destroyed that atonement has to be made for sin and everlasting righteousness brought in. If Yeshua is not the Messiah, we have no answer to those. And in fact, I've had rabbis tell me they didn't come to pass. They were conditional, and they didn't, they, even though they were promised, they didn't happen. No, they did happen. The Messiah himself visited the temple and poured out the spirit there in Shavuot. The glory of the second temple was greater than the glory of the first. God himself in the person of Messiah visited the temple and brought cleansing and purging. And Messiah died to usher in everlasting righteousness and make atonement for sin. If he didn't do it, forget it. Let's all go home. There is no Messiah. There's no possible candidate. The second thing, that he first has to suffer and then, then be exalted. If you look in Isaiah 52, 13 to Isaiah 53, 12, one of the, the key texts that we always discuss in the Tanakh, and, and ultimately, I can argue clearly, a, a definite messianic prophecy. It, it begins by saying, My servant will prosper, act wisely, he'll be lifted up, highly exalted. But then it says, he'll, his, he'll be so marred, he, he will be beaten, bruised to the point you can't even tell. He's a, he's, he's a human being. First, it speaks of his exaltation, but it only comes after his suffering and abasement. Let's go further. The Talmud asks, in Sanhedrin 96b and following, Daniel 7 says that, that he'll come in the clouds of heaven. Zechariah 9 says he'll come meek and lowly riding on a donkey. Which will it be? The Talmud says if we're worthy, he'll come in the clouds of heaven, which Rashi says means quickly. If we're not worthy, he'll come riding on a donkey, which Rashi says means Slowly. Well, the text, of course, doesn't say fast or slow. It says clouds of heaven riding on a donkey. Talmud says, well, it's one or the other. No, it's both and. It's both and. They're both prophesied. Mm -hmm. First he comes riding on a donkey. Then he'll come in the clouds of heaven. Last, last point. If you look in Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, it speaks of the mission of the servant of the Lord. And part of his mission, re repeated in Isaiah, the 49th chapter, is to be a light to the nations. Or the goyim. It says the distant lands will wait for his Torah, wait for his teaching. It also indicates in Isaiah, the 49th chapter, that this servant who fulfills the mission of Israel, who represents Israel, will be rejected by his own people to the point that he says to God, I've labored in vain. It says your mission is to regather the people of Israel. And he says, the servant says, I've labored in vain. And God says, in effect, no, you haven't. Not only will you regather them, but you will also be a light to the nations that my salvation may go to the ends of the earth. So what happens? 
First, he's rejected, as the scripture says, Isaiah 53 over and over lays out that we misunderstood it, we got it wrong. We thought he was dying for his own sins when he was dying really for ours. He suffers, he dies, he's rejected by our people, just as the prophetic scriptures say. He becomes a light to the nations, and then the hearts of Israel will turn back to him. So everything's right on track. And by the way, uh, last point, if, if someone, I know I have like eight last points, but sorry. Um, if, if someone says he didn't fulfill any provable prophecies, all, you know, when you say he died, he rose, well, we weren't there, you can't prove, he didn't fulfill any provable prophecies. Well, how about being a light to the ends of the earth, how about making God known to, to, to several billion people around the world? How about being the most influential Jew, the most influential rabbi who ever lived? I, I, I've been overseas more than 100 different trips in outlying parts of India, Africa, and found people praying for Israel and saying, we love the Jews, we pray for Israel. Why? Because Jesus the Messiah. Uh, I'd say that's a pretty dramatic thing. And to be rejected by your people, to die to rise, to become a light to the nations as the prophets declared, and to have come, died, and done all this before the second temple was destroyed, it's laid out. There can be no other candidate. He did the first, he'll do the rest. Whereas our Jewish friends, rabbis, have been praying for centuries for Messiah to come. They don't even have one coming. We have the deposit, the down payment. His first, we know he'll return. Uh, Yes, ma'am. Thank you for patiently waiting. Hi, Mike. I'm Vanina Taylor. Nice to meet you. Oh, nice to meet you. Um, I was waiting for you last month to, to be on my radio show. Right, and it didn't work out that I could come down, and things got kind of hectic. Well, nice, but nice that, to have you. Just to let you know that it's not that nobody was willing to talk to you, but I happened to just return from the United States, and uh, you were interested in rabbis anyway, not me. But um, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm on record as saying I'm perfectly interested. You're welcome on my radio show anytime. All right, so we can talk. Not now, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But I, um, just for the public. So, Okay, so, so obviously you just gave another eight points that I would love to address, but I'm just going to keep it real short. The one thing, and you yourself will also have to admit, I believe, that when you shared that the uh, Jewish writings all talk about the death of a, a tzaddi, a righteous person, mechaper, making a, an atonement mm -hmm. on behalf of the nation, that when you're reading all of the Jewish writings referring to this, you know what the meaning is that the Jewish writings are referring to, and they're not saying that a righteous person can die on behalf of the sins of an individual, which is what Christianity teaches that Jesus did, because a whole nation, even a Christian nation, does not get redemption because they're a Christian nation. Each individual person has to put their faith and belief in Jesus, right? The, the Christian understanding is that Jesus died as an atonement for the sins of each individual who puts his faith in him. Whereas the Jewish understanding of the tzaddik mechaper, or dying as an atonement, is on behalf of the entire nation. Because we see throughout the Tanakh that God refers to the Jewish people, you are my witnesses in the plural, and also you are my servant in the singular. And so even though we are individuals who have to individually make mm -hmm. tshuva, which you know tshuva has always been the way that somebody gets atonement mm -hmm. from God, regardless of whether we had sacrifices or not at the time. But that as, in, as a nation, as one entity, when we lose the righteous among us, that that loss makes an expitiation mm -hmm. for the nation. The Jewish concept never allowed for the idea that one person would die for the, on behalf of the sins of another. And in fact, you know the Tanakh says, Hashem says, God says, that each man will die for his own sins. And there's no room for this idea of a person dying on behalf of another person, even in Jewish thought. Yeah, okay, so I, I appreciate the question. And um, if you have other questions and want to get online behind Panini, that's fine. But since we haven't had an opportunity to dialogue, why don't you stick around for a minute? We can extend this for a moment. Panini is a, a well-known counter-missionary, so we're finally getting to meet. We hoped to meet in the States, but it, but it didn't work out. Uh, and at one point, you would say you believed what I believe. Absolutely. Right. Um, I would say you've never been in my shoes, I've never been in yours, so that's all subjective from there. But she, she would have been uh, arguing from a perspective at one point that would have resembled mine, at least. Uh, and of course, we've got friends on the other side that were in your shoes that are over with me. So ultimately, you guys have to decide for yourself. All right, so, so first thing, uh, I, I, I differ with your reading of the scriptures, uh, and I differ with your interpretation of Jewish tradition, and I differ with your interpretation of what Jesus did. So each major point you made, I, I differ with. Let, let me start in reverse. Uh, the concept is not that, that Jesus died for someone potentially 
and that if they put their faith in him, there's atonement, he bore the sin of the entire world. He, he bore the sin of, of every human being that ever lived, according to scripture. It's not actualized for them without repentance. That would be very similar uh, to the concept of the death of the righteous atones or to the concept of the sacrifice of Isaac is what empowers all of the later sacrifices. In fact, it's an exact harmony with Yom Kippur that, that it's laid out clearly about Yom Kippur that the sacrifice is made for the entire nation, atonement's made for the entire nation, but if someone does not participate in it, they're cut off. So it's the exact same concept. Uh, and there are other uh, Talmudic rabbis that actually said because of their suffering, if you add in a few others, it could free everybody from in, in the entire world from suffering, but does everyone get free? No, because we don't turn to God. So the New Testament is, lays out plainly a message that's in, in thorough harmony with this, also based primarily on the teaching of, of Tanakh because some of these Jewish traditions come later. So I, I don't see any, any contradiction. And again, if, if we think of the sacrificial system, atonement is made for Israel, right? Yom Kippur for the whole nation, sins of the whole nation born into the wilderness and, and atoned for with blood. And if individuals, I mean, it's explicitly laid out in, in Leviticus, if individuals turn away, don't participate, don't humble themselves that day, it doesn't avail for them. So it's the exact same concept. Isaac underlying the sacrifices, exact same concept. It's not automatic for anybody. In fact, a counter missionary was taking me to task the other day because he said, look, no matter what happens, it's not efficacious unless somebody repents. I said, that's my exact belief. That's the whole message. That's the whole thing I've said. So atonement's made for everyone. The death of the truly righteous one atones for the sins of the entire world, and it's made efficacious for us when we turn in repentance and put our faith in Messiah. But the difference, would you admit, like, for example, you're saying that Jesus died on behalf of on the whole world. Mm -hmm. right? And then all you have to do is do tshuva, is to repent, and then you, put your faith in him. Put your faith so, in him. Okay. Tshuva. So here's the difference: is that as far as the death of a righteous person, I'm not talking about uh, the yearly sacrifices that were commanded. That's another question, and you and I could go back and forth probably for hours on this. Um, but as far as the concept of the death of a righteous person, person atoning for the nation. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's not something you had to put your faith in. God judged the entire nation more favorably because of the death of a righteous person, regardless of whether the, those people, those individuals in that nation said, ah, Rebbe Akiva, okay, he was our tzaddik who died on our behalf. You didn't have to believe in him for that to have an effect, for example. Right, right. Well, f first thing was, first thing was, if you, if you remember, I said that the rabbis were not secret believers in Jesus. And what I'm trying to do is open people up to a concept all right, where this very concept is not some foreign Christian later thing, but something grounded in scripture and in harmony with Jewish tradition. That's, that's the first thing. Secondly, what about the New Year's uh, prayer that I quoted, uh, uh, Bibi Bar Abba, where he's, he prays specifically because of what Isaac did. In other words, appeal is made to God because of what someone did. Why make the appeal if it's automatic? So, so, and people still had to turn to God in repentance to receive benefits, so we're saying the same thing. Acts 20, 21. What's the message? Turn to God in repentance and, and put one's faith in Yeshua. And, and here's the other thing. This is one strand of, of argument simply to say that the idea that the Messiah dies on the cross on behalf of the sins of the world is founded in Scripture. I mean, of course, I can argue it just by Tanakh. And in harmony with later Jewish tradition, all right? Not the Jewish tradition preaches this, but when the light goes on and people see it, it's happened with many over the years, they realize, oh, this is what it's talking about. This makes sense. That's why people even pray the, why even pray the prayer? Well, you know, after the Baba Rebbe died, the, the, the biography comes up immediately and they're saying, may his death be an atonement. Pe people were specifically looking to what he did and saying, may his death be an atonement. There's no difference. There's no difference. And, all, and we have the rest of the message, all the Messianic prophecies telling us it's Yeshua. So it, it's kind of sealed in that level. I still think that you are kind of glossing over and mixing up this idea of individual atonement versus national atonement. But you and I could sit here and do this all night, and I'm okay, afraid so that we're so not going to accomplish for, 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 for clarification, is it Jewish tradition that the death of the righteous atones for the sins of the generation? Of the nation, of the group as a whole, absolutely. Fine, fine, fine. Okay. It is a concept. It's fine, not found fine. in the Tanakh. What's found in Tanakh is Isaiah 53 and other passages. So Which I don't, we should discuss some tradition time. Because Tanakh <laughs> lays it out clearly enough. All right, the first thing, that, that tradition is taught. All right, are there people who, when, when a famous rabbi dies, will appeal to God on behalf of that rabbi and say, may his death bring atonement for us? 
Yes or no? As a nation. Yes. Uh, 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 listen, listen. I just asked a que I just asked that question. Will they appeal? So it's not automatic because they are making an appeal. No, that's not necessarily true. Just because so, so it's going to happen asking, whether they appeal or not. So their prayers make no difference. To the, according to the the people that you have quoted, yes. According to Jewish tradition, this concept, yes. It's a widespread. A but listen, it's. Parts. I'm not missing it. I'm simply saying that when you realize that this applies to Yeshua. The light goes on that this is not a foreign, you know, Jesus saves Christian concept. This is grounded in scripture and in harmony with Jewish tradition. Very simply. I'm not saying it's a perfect gospel parallel. I said that from the start. I'm saying that it is a very clear parallel. Jewish scholars have pointed to it for years. I mean, Gezer Vermish, one of the top scholars of early Judaic at Oxford University, went into this at great length and said this gives us background to understand how some of these concepts formed in, in, in early Christian thought because they're thoroughly Jewish. The, the martyrs in 4th Maccabees when, when, they're, when, when they're dying in our war of liberation, they're, they're praying that their, their blood would be like the blood of Isaac and through that mercy would be given to the nation. And ultimately, Messiah's death will produce national repentance and all Israel will be saved. There will be a national turning because of what he's done. But uh, anyway, why don't you go on with a, another question if you like. <laughs> that's, that's fine if you'd like to raise another point. But anybody else, don't be yeah, intimidated please, by our dialogue. Else. Feel free to, to join in. <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't have to be up front of the camera. All right, but if, if there's time, Panina, by all means. Uh, my question is about uh, the first century understanding of the lineage of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You have the two genealogies, one in Matthew, one in Luke. And if we understand correctly, Jesus couldn't be a direct descendant of, of King David because his father is not David, obviously. He doesn't have a biological father. Mm -hmm. So what is your understanding or explanation of that? I know today most families that say they're descended from King David are usually through Rashi, which is actually a maternal lineage anyways, but they're not claiming literal descent from King David, they're just, or direct descent, they're claiming a descent from King David in some, you know, biological way, but not a paternal descent. So how do, how do we understand Jesus' descent from King David? Uh, yeah, so the question is, why do the Gospels, uh, Matthew and, and Luke, Matthew 1 and Luke 3, provide two different genealogies of, of, uh, of Yeshua, I mean quite intentionally, and they're preserved by, by the, the early New Testament writers who took these things very seriously. I mean, after all, they believed Messiah had come, so they took this very seriously. So why did they preserve clearly two different genealogies? Uh, it's important that the genealogies are there because of the nature of who Yeshua is. On the one hand, he is the son of David. On the other hand, he's greater than David. Uh, in, in fact, Midrash to Isaiah 52:13 which speaks of it in terms of messianic terms, says that the Messiah is, is higher than Abraham, Moses, even than the ministering angels. So uh, that, that being the case, uh, we see on the one hand, he's greater than David, you know, uh, Daniel 7 coming in the clouds of heaven. On the other hand, he's a descendant of David. So the two genealogies really lay it out for us best. Uh, and I believe the best way to understand them is Matthew's genealogy is the genealogy through his, his earthly father or his foster father, David, to say that he, he is in that divine line. And by the way, uh, I could ask you a question, what's the halakha, what's the traditional Jewish law about someone born of a virgin? It Does, doesn't exist, right? Uh, so, so you have to have something that transcendent and yet born according to the prophecy. So first thing, I, I understand Matthew chapter 1 is referring to the uh, genealogy clearly through, the, through his father, Joseph, which is the most obvious way to read it. Uh, but it ex explains it that he's virgin born. His, his birth is supernatural. Uh, Luke 3 is best understood as a genealogy of his mother Miriam, whom from what we can glean in, in other parts of the New Testament, other references would have herself been descendant of David. So it's, uh, it was as thought the son of so-and-so who was actually the son of so-and-so uh, in Luke 3. So it's actually the genealogy of Miriam, his mother. So in, in terms of actual physical descent, he would come through his mother. Uh, in terms of the line to the throne, it would be through his earthly father. But his, he's earth born and he's also the son of God. He's the son of David and he's greater than David. So I guess that's the question. How can he be the son of David? And actually, I'm not playing devil's advocate. I actually do believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. I'm just, it's, a, it's a question that I have that um, how can you be a son of King David, a direct descent of King David, if, you're, if you have no earthly father? So how can, if God is your father, which 
Right, because you have an, because Jesus, you have an Jesus earthly father. mother, and because you so have a precedent. So, a biological Jesus. descendant of King David. That's the way we should understand that the Messiah is a descendant of King David, but not a direct paternal descent. Yeah, he is a biological son of David through his mother, okay. uh, and and he is son of God, greater than David, and he takes up the whole argument himself, Matthew 22 and other, and other places, from Psalm 110, saying the Messiah cannot just be the son of David, he's also greater than David. Uh, and you even have the question uh, of, in, in Numbers, it comes up with the doors of Salafkot, where uh, the, the inheritance can't pass on because there are, no, there are no sons, and how does it pass on? Passes on through them. There's even a genealogy in First Chronicles that I, that I point to in, in volume four, of my series Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, which seems to indicate that in the case where there was no father, the genealogy, uh, uh, no son, the genealogy uh, continues through the daughter. So we actually have precedent in scripture for that and fulfilled in Messiah. But Is that the, the fact- Like to fulfill the prophecy though that he, the Messiah would be a descendant of King David, that's all, I, that's the question. Yeah, of course it's enough. What's the Jewish response to that? What's it, sh go, go, go for it. it. <laughs> We're trying to, get a, trying to get a rabbi or counter missionary. I'm glad you showed up. Yeah, so. except that we do have to keep it somewhat short because we didn't plan on a debate today. Um, I didn't plan on a debate today. And debates should have rules too. Um, okay, so. What's the rabbinic response to okay, that? Okay, so. All right, first of all, in order for somebody to be the Messiah, there are actually five qualifications that they have to fulfill, some of which Jesus clearly did. He has to be male, no problem. Now, how do you know this? Because when we read, and unfortunately I'm not prepared with the passages for you, I apologize. It says that it's the sons, it's through the sons and through the fathers, and I can give you those passages. No, but I'm like, just but asking how you know, I, I'm not trying to be antagonistic, there are no, okay, there are but no. how do you know that um, in the first century that there was this concept when there's so many different ideas about who Messiah would be, and, and, and you've got the Dead Sea Scrolls looking for two Messiahs, Messiah of Aaron and, and David, and other Jewish literature speaking of two Messiahs, and all kinds, of, you know, all kinds of different speculation in the literature of the day as to what Messiah would do, etc. And some not even believing in a messianic figure. Aren't you projecting later Jewish tradition when you say there are five things we know? Who even? The scriptures clearly indicate that the person who's going to reign at this end times is a king. And therefore, he is a descendant of David through Solomon. No, He's no, not Trinity. through Solomon. Not through Solomon. A hundred percent not through Solomon. How do you show that? Oh, the Bible. <laughs> All right, so, so hang on. Really? So, so let, let me address that. Does the Messiah have to descend from Solomon? Absolutely, totally, no. Here, here's what happens. All right? Uh, and, and do you have a set of, of, of all my volumes? No, I have. All right. Whatever you're missing, I'll send you because Volume Four lays it out in depth, and you'll find in, in, in Mishnah Torah that Rambam doesn't mention descent through Solomon. By the way, it's it's very important. Here's what happened. God made a promise to David. All right, and you can get back to your point in a second. God made a promise to David, and said, no matter what happened, that the lamp would not depart from his house. Right, like happened with King Saul, Shaul. He sinned, and that was it. At end of his reign. He said it won't be the case with David. Now, if your son sinned, God said, I'll discipline them, but. Messiah had to come from, from the uh, descendant of David. That's why it talks about the throne of David many times. House of David, you don't see house of Solomon, throne of Solomon. Those terms hardly occur. So what happened? God now renews that promise to Solomon and says, if you will walk in my commandments, otherwise judgment will come. And quite explicitly, because of his sin, he forfeited that right. So it goes back to it just has to come through David. It's explicit in scripture. I give all the texts in volume four. And that's why you don't find Rambam saying that it's a requirement in Mishnah Torah, because it's not. Well, we do know, for example, we know that all of the tribal lineage, like you talked about the daughters of Tzalaf, I can't pronounce right. it either. Um, that one of the requirements placed on them was that they could inherit the land only if they married men who were of their parents' tri of their tribe, because tribal lineage only goes through the male of the line. Did it happen with Yeshua? Who did Miriam marry? Descendant of David. Yes, but he wasn't his father. Right, God was his father. So what does the Holocaust so say about that? God is not a descendant of Judah. Correct. God is not a descendant of David. Oh, so, so, so you agree that inherited. Jesus is the Son of God, but you reject no, him as Messiah. I'm ah, not. okay. Let's really get clear actually, here. My, my, my theory actually agrees kind of with the, uh, the Talmud on this, that it was probably a Roman soldier, but that's another story altogether. Okay, fine. Um, the point is, is that you know as well as I do, that, for example, if a woman marries a Kohen, and she has a child, and the child's a Kohen, right? The child can serve in the temple, 
mm -hmm. right? And if the child's father dies, the child is still a Kohen. The child can still, I mean, in theory, if we're in the times of the temple, okay? okay. He can still serve, right? Mother decides to remarry. She can remarry anybody she wants. It doesn't matter that her son is a, a Ben Kohen. Okay. A Kohen. So let's say she marries somebody who's of the tribe of Judah. Okay, and he loves his son so much that he wants to adopt him so that he can be the inheritor of all of his property and all of his estate and all of his things like mm -hmm. that. Okay, now there's certain limits because depending on when we're talking about, he couldn't have inherited land, but that's another question. Okay, so the guy adopts this woman's child who's a Kohen. He's from the tribe of Judah. He can be king, but he can't be priest. But what about this child? This child doesn't automatically become from the tribe of Judah, someone who can inherit, who can become king. So let, let me ask, all right, so let me ask for clarification. Then. Since the Tanakh is explicit that the, the Messiah will be a priestly king, that he will be a Kohen uh, like Melchizedek, and it's explicit in Zechariah 6. Have you read my article about Melchizedek? Nope. I'll have to send it to you. Please do. Uh, have you written on Zechariah 6? <laughs> yeah, ah. Probably. Ah. Probably. In Zechariah 6, what it lays out is that Yehoshua, the high priest, elsewhere known in Tanakh as Yeshua, by the way, just an interesting little point, that he will sit on a throne wearing crowns to represent the one called Semach, who's the Messiah. So the Messiah is represented as a priest sitting on his throne. That's, that's why... The Dead Sea Scrolls were looking for two messiahs, the Messiah, son of Aaron, and the Messiah, son of David. They're not two messiahs. The reason it was a priest sitting on his throne that represented the Messiah was because he was a priestly king. What, what, what you're failing to factor in, though, just in short, is if, in fact, Yeshua is the one prophesied in Tanakh, he is a son of David and greater than David. How can that be? I'm explaining how it can be. I'm explaining it. You're reducing him to a mere mortal, and Tanakh is against that. If he was a mere mortal, you'd be right and Tanakh would be wrong. The fact is, Tanakh clearly lays out he's greater than man. He's both man and God appearing in human form. He's the one that fulfills explicit prophecies about that. And as Benjamin Summer said, it's in harmony with Jewish thought as well. Oh, but Benjamin Summer is a conservative, and you yourself said that the conservative movement didn't have, it wasn't strong enough to give you an upbringing that would connect. But it had good scholars. It's got some fine scholarship. <laughs> yeah. Got some fine scholarship. Yeah, right. As long as we can use it for our own point. It's got some fine scholarship, whether I agree or disagree. There's some fine anyway, scholars. There's there's lots of points that you brought up, and I would love to actually have a discussion with you based completely on the Tanakh proofs that, that the Messiah can be divine, because I would argue that it's not there. And in fact, the idea that God would come in a form is not only idolatry in a modern Jewish mind, but it's in the Tanakh as well. And uh, if we didn't have so, I didn't want, don't want to monopolize the evening and whatever, but... No, I'm, um, I'm pleased that you're here and, and by choice giving you the opportunity to do it. And I think it's educational, yes, to hear from someone that's done thinking about this. So uh, let, me, let me just ask you one question. Um, excuse me? No, that's uh, yeah. okay. So, so uh, <laughs> trust me, we're uh, glad to set it up. Uh, I was waiting. We, we had made plans and all that. And sorry it didn't work out. No, I was going to give me. you two hours on my radio show and a whole bit, well, equal time, that's... debate, yeah. and any time, with, okay. with joy. I, I know you've looked okay. at these things seriously, so with, with joy. Uh, it would be enriching for everyone. But uh, you, you would say that in Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, it's emphasized that there was no tuna, there was no form that, that Israel saw, that's right? right? Uh, Explain to me Numbers 12 where it says that Moses saw the Tumunah, the form of the Lord. You mean when it says that he saw his back? No, no, no. That's, that's oh, Exodus that's 33. Right. Numbers 12 where it says that he saw the Tumunah of the Lord. Okay, so without... Does God have a Tumunah? Obviously without having a... Uh, not only a Tanakh in front of me, but not being prepared for this. That's fine. I don't, I don't want to embarrass but you. We understand that you can see... You, you have seen God in your life, but you haven't physically seen him. You know, so there are lots of things, but clearly we are not to worship God in any form. God would not put himself in the form of a man. He said that. You know, he said he's not a man, but right. God appears in the form of a man in Genesis 18 quite explicitly, and they have a conversation with someone called Yahweh quite explicitly. I mean, the only fair reading of that text is that Yahweh appears with two angels to Abraham, and then Yahweh has a dialogue with Abraham, and then Yahweh leaves, and the, the two angels go to Solomon. It's the only, only fair way to read it, unless someone's trying to, to get away from something there. But, but with, with uh, obviously you don't agree, otherwise you'd be up doing what I'm doing here. But uh, <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll continue this, God willing, okay. but the door's wide open. I'd love Sounds to do good. it. All right, uh, question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, but for, for thanks for giving place to Panina, and thanks for coming out in, in an environment where you didn't have equal time. Thank you. I, I appreciate that.
Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I have two questions. Uh, my first question uh, is concerning the so-called resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sure. And um, you, I liked how you related the, you know, the cross and uh, the atonement of one righteous individual for an entire nation of four people. Yeah. And for the world. Uh, but what role does the resurrection have to play in this? Because from what I've always been told is that eschatologically, that when Messiah came, there would be a great resurrection of the righteous in Jewish tradition. And so my question is, uh, how is it that one individual can be raised from the dead, but not all of the righteous? In the great, world? very good question. Okay, and my second question then is, if uh, it is all true, that is the gospel message, how is it that so many Jews throughout history, and even today, who study Torah all of their lives, uh, are immersed within the scriptures, the prophets included, can reject it? So sure. Okay, so, so let me answer in reverse order. Uh, the answer to the second question is really very simple. Uh, how can there be learned rabbis, devoted people, some men of incredible learning, women of, of great devotion, uh, for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries, rejecting even the possibility that Jesus is Messiah? Uh, the answer is simple. 99% uh, of never considered it in, in, an, in an open environment. In, in other words, why don't Muslims uh, believe in Buddha? Why don't, you know, why, why don't Christians believe in Muhammad? For the great part, it's never been considered. It's never been looked at in an unprejudiced environment. So when, when people from their earliest moments, think of this, in a traditional Jewish home, from the earliest thinking moments, that child is taught what to pray, how to pray, how to relate. Jesus wouldn't even come up. If he came up, it would be in a hostile form. And then, sadly, through much of church history, the church is, uh, or, or at least the public face of the church has done anything but present Jesus. So you're presenting a completely maligned, idolatrous form of him, number one. Uh, number two, the people are not considering the possibility that he could be Messiah. Uh, everything from their earliest moment of thinking is a religion going in a different direction from this. And where he is mentioned, he's mentioned in hostile terms. <laughs> so it's a miracle. Look at it the other way. It's a miracle that in every generation there have been Jews who believe. It's a, it's a miracle that we hear from Hasidim and, and other ultra-Orthodox people who have to contact us secretly because they're afraid of, of what can happen to them in their community, as, as is potential in, in other religious communities of great devotion that going against it could be costly. Uh, they contact us because they, they discover Messiah in the scriptures uh, or, or in their God working in their lives in different ways. So the answer to the second question is that he's 99% of the time not been considered as an option. Where it is considered, it's considered with such prejudice against him, it's a miracle that any believe. Uh, with with um, response to your first question about uh, uh, the resurrection, uh, the, the, the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, do not lay out plainly this idea uh, that there will be a resurrection of the Messiah with all the righteous. Uh, that is later Jewish uh, teaching about final resurrection and things like that. What we do see, the reason we, we emphasize his resurrection is without his resurrection, his, his death is just another death. If he doesn't rise and continue his work, uh, if, if he cannot continue his work as per Isaiah 53, he's cut off from the land of the living, he, he, he dies, how can he continue his work unless he rises? So the resurrection has to be there. Psalm 22, which is the psalm of an ideal righteous sufferer, uh, that, that uh, it's not a prophecy as much as a psalm of an ideal righteous sufferer who's delivered from the jaws of death and his deliverance from death is so great that praise goes to the ends of the earth. Uh, that is fulfilled in Yeshua, the ideal righteous sufferer, whose deliverance from death brings praise to God from the ends of the earth. No one else has done that. But there's something even more specific that the New Testament addresses and it does confirm your idea of a resurrection of the righteous in conjunction with the Messiah. Uh, Matthew does record uh, this account of, of righteous people getting up out of their graves after his resurrection, which is obviously a, a, a foretaste of what's going to happen. But think of this for a moment. Uh, according to New Testament writings, Messiah dies during, during what religious Jewish holiday? Passover. Pesach. Okay? So he dies as the Passover lamb, shedding his blood to bring deliverance to the people. Uh, John the Immerser, Yochanan the Immerser, in John 1, 29, sees him and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says that Messiah, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed for us, right? He dies, Passover. He rises in conjunction with first fruits, 
which was the day after the Sabbath and the Passover. Okay? So you've got Pesach, the beginning of the celebration. Sabbath, Messiah die, uh, dies uh, the day before that, rises the day after Sabbath, rises on a Sunday, which would be first fruits. What does Paul write in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter? Messiah has risen from the dead and become the first fruits of those who slept. So his resurrection is a first fruits in conjunction with first fruits uh, festival, according to the Torah. Uh, Leviticus 23 is, is, lays, lays them all out clearly. So he, he dies at the time of Passover. He rises in conjunction with first fruits, and he is the first fruits of those that sleep, of all the other resurrections. By the way, what's the next major holiday in the biblical calendar? Torah? Shavuot. Shavuot. Okay. And according to Jewish tradition, what happened to Shavuot? The law was given on Mount Sinai, mountain on fire. Some Jewish traditions speak of God speaking in different languages so that everyone would hear as he spoke from Sinai. So what happens now in the New Testament at Shavuot? The Holy Spirit's given. How? Tongues of fire. Oh, by the way, remember when the Torah was given that the, the Israelites got anxious when Moses stayed up on Mount Sinai, as a result of which uh, they made a golden calf, and then Moses came down, smashes the tablets. How many Israelites died? About how many? 3,000. Torah is perfect, but the sinfulness of man brings judgment. Holy Spirit's poured out. Shavuot, same time. How many Jews put their faith in Messiah that day? 3,000. Fascinating. And then, by the way, according to the New Testament, what is a major thing that will happen when Messiah returns? It's, it speaks of it in Matthew 24 and 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, Revelation, the 11th chapter. Sounding of the trumpet. The sound, he comes with the sounding of the trumpet, the last trumpet. What's the next major holy day on the biblical calendar? Gap of several months time after Shavuot. What's the next day? Yom Truah, day of the sounding of the trumpet, which Jewish tradition becomes Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year. So his death is in accordance with Passover, his resurrection, first fruits, giving of the spirit, Shavuot. His return will be in conjunction with trumpets. And it's laid out clearly in the New Testament. After which national atonement for Israel, Yom Kippur. And then what follows that? Sukkot, tabernacles, the ingathering of the nations to Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, what do you have? Return of Messiah. Zechariah 13, national cleansing. Zechariah 14, Sukkot. It's marvelous. It's, it's laid out in scripture. Uh, Okay, any other questions just before? Uh, yes, go ahead. He's going to ask a question and then mine will be the last. Okay, that's fine. Go ahead. You've got... else who wants to ask a question? Okay, my question is the context is ever since I've lived in Israel the last 30 years, a little bit before that, I've seen firsthand a lot of what you could call persecution of Jewish believers by Yad Lachim missionary, anti missionary organizations such as this. And what I'd like to hear your uh, take on what is the reason for Jewish hostility towards Messianic Jews, or not so much Christianity, but specifically Jewish believers in Jesus. Uh, yeah, there are a whole bunch of different reasons. Uh, but in Jewish eyes, we would be called Meshumadim. We would be the worst of apostates. The concept would be our ancestors died rather than apostatize, and now you are willingly apostatizing. And worst of all, you're missionaries. Uh, I've, I've been at meetings where people were standing outside with signs saying you're worse than Hitler. Hitler wanted our bodies, you want our souls. Uh, also, the history of anti-Semitism in much of the professing church, uh, the, the uh, European anti-Semitism that paved the way for the Holocaust. So there's a direct connection between that religion considered to be bloody persecuting Jews and now Messianic Jews also are considered to be deceptive that, that Messianic Jews are putting on some kind of show by, by celebrating Shabbat, uh, by, by keeping the biblical calendar, so as to deceive unsuspecting Jews. So uh, if that were the case, I understand the anger. Of course, it's based on terrible misconceptions. A lot of times it's misinformation. Sometimes people actually hear lies that people are bribing children or doing this or kidnapping. And so so a, a lot of, I always try to give the benefit of the doubt and not just look at it as raw hatred or, 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 or sinat chinam, hatred without a cause that scripture speaks of. Uh, and according to Jewish tradition, the second temple was destroyed because of hatred without a cause. And why, why was Yeshua died? He says they hated me, with, uh, he was killed, they hated me without a cause. I mean, it's, Jewish tradition was more right on that than it realized. But uh, a lot of times it's misinformation. Uh, I know it personally because there are counter missionaries, rabbis, that were at one time hostile to me that still absolutely oppose what I do, but we're, we're dear friends. I mean, we talk by phone. 
we pray for each other to see the truth. Uh, you know, I just posted on Facebook that I'd be, I'd be here. By the way, my website is askdrbrown.org, A-S-K-D-R, Brown, askdrbrown.org. Um, you can be my friend, Panina. Uh, <laughs> I'm out of personal space but, but on Facebook, but my, my uh, general Facebook page is Ask Dr. Brown, A-S-K-D-R, Brown, on Facebook. But when I posted that I was going to be uh, here, and I just pray that Yeshua would be uh, lifted up in spirit and truth. One counter-missionary rabbi with whom I've had a very friendly dialogue, a, a fine young man, uh, he posted and said, may, may, God, uh, may God lead everyone at the lecture to follow his truth. And I said, amen. So, I mean, that's what we're jointly praying and believing for. That being said, uh, the persecution, as painful as it can be, like an Ami Ortiz that, you know, blown up and miraculously preserved and healed, uh, as ugly as it can be, one of my friend's congregations was firebombed years ago, and, and the government often turns a deaf ear to it. It's a good sign. Uh, Yeshua told us to rejoice and be glad because that's how the prophets were persecuted before us. So on the other hand, uh, I would say that our faith is also a threat. It's a threat to those who don't believe. Uh, it's a threat to those who are traditional Jews uh, because of which uh, there's hatred and hostility towards us. And some of it's just fueled up satanically. I mean, there's, there is a spiritual enemy that wants to destroy people. And that's what happens. So I'm, I'm not in, re, in relationship or dialogue, as far as I know, with anyone, say, with Yad Lachim, and their tactics, which sometimes have, have approached physical violence or included physical violence, would be different than all the counter-missionaries that I know. Most of the ones I know are, are honorable people. But uh, many years ago, uh, about 1993, a Hasidic uh, man approached this young man, 18 years old, wanted to find out more, uh, came to faith in Yeshua. Uh, moved to Maryland and was kidnapped. His parents sent people. Uh, he was kidnapped right, right from uh, our, our uh, office building in Maryland. He was beaten. He was uh, kept drugged here for some years in Israel. It was an ugly, ugly story. So those things do exist. They're pitiful. Is that a picture of the community as a whole? Certainly not. Uh, but there's bad apples everywhere, unfortunately. And I, I feel real bad for the folks that do it. There's never hostility on my end. I feel bad because they, they don't understand. So we pray for them. All right. Uh, I realize there are a lot of more questions. If you want to ask more questions, I didn't ask him, but I'm sure he's willing to stay here until the university closes. Sure. Uh, so Do you mean closes go... in the future or tonight? Because <laughs> <laughs> I do have to go back to America. Um, you can personally ask him, interact with him in the dialogue. Or you can go to my website, Ask Dr. Brown. <laughs> um, you talked a lot about atonement, and, and there are a lot of scriptures being quoted. Um, I just have a simple question. Um, how a death of a man 2,000 years ago can make my position in front of God better or clean or atone for my sins? Sure. Uh, so how can someone dying 2,000 years ago bring atonement? Uh, the, the, the first thing is, again, nothing's automatic. Nothing absolves us of responsibility. In fact, the New Testament makes clear that those that reject Messiah's death have, have more accountability and more culpability, those that knowingly reject his death, uh, than those that rejected the, the Torah of Moses. Uh, if you look for a parallel, a parallel in Jewish tradition, you have the idea that Isaac's death was efficacious through the generations. Uh, you have a Shimon Bar Yochai, saying that because of what he suffered, and then his son, and I mentioned this without quoting the text earlier, he and his son and another man that had suffered terribly, that because of what they suffered, they could free the world in the future, potentially. The fact is, God was never primarily interested in the blood of bulls and goats. It was something that he ordained, blood sacrifice. It was a way of people giving an offering. It was a way of, of people giving something precious. And it was a picture as Rashi says in Leviticus 17, of life for life. I sin, the sacrifice takes my place. But of course, God was never primarily interested in the blood of bulls and goats. And when the people were in hypocrisy, he said, I don't want your Shabbat observance. I don't want your prayers. I don't want your offerings. So if the heart was not right, all these things were worthless. The, the, the prayer of the wicked is an abomination. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. So someone... Uh, trying to use the death of Jesus to absolve them from responsibility is misunderstanding. It's, it what, it's what brings us freedom, repentance, and a new life of obedience. But the parallels in Jewish tradition of Isaac's suffering, potentially 
atoning for future generations or empowering the sacrifices in future generations. That's what happened with Messiah. The perfectly righteous one is the only one God was ever looking at. The blood sacrifices had their place, but ultimately pointing to him. When the perfectly righteous one came, son of God walking among us, God tabernacling among us. And by the way, New Testament does not teach that God ceased being God in heaven and then came down here and walked among us like Zeus or Apollos or one of the Greek gods. It says that he fills the universe, that he sits enthroned in heaven, and at the same time, by his spirit, speaks, acts, works, and in the person of his son came and walked among us, tabernacled among us, just as God's presence filled the, sh the, the temple, uh, filled the tabernacle, the mishkan, the, the dwelling place of God. So in short, it's because of who he was, the perfect son of God, the perfect Messiah, that he could take all the sins of the entire world for all generations. He had to come at a certain point. So all sins committed before then, all sins in the future. And when people turn to God and ask for mercy through his death, God forgives, God cleanses. And just to close with this note, the message again is simple. There's responsibility on our end to turn to God in repentance, to acknowledge our guilt, to say I've sinned, to not make excuses. No matter what our condition, we're, we're, we all are accountable whether we were born certain ways and, and always had a propensity to do this and this and this, we, we're still responsible. We have to fully acknowledge our guilt and then recognize God's too holy. I could never do enough good. I could never be good enough to be accepted by him. And we plead for mercy. The question is, well, what happens to all of our sins? So God says, I'll take all your sins, all your guilt, put them on the shoulders of the Messiah, the one perfectly righteous one who can carry them all. He will die to take your place. So there's justice and there's mercy. And that's the gospel message. And when we turn in repentance and faith, God washes us clean, gives us a brand new start, and empowers us to live a new life. So hopefully uh, to be continued, certainly to be continued. And I appreciate you coming. Are there, uh, so I, I'm, I'm happy to hang around. I'm here in Israel just for a few days before heading back. So if, if there's something really pressing that you want to ask or differ with me, then push your way to the front. I'm a New York Jew, so just kind of push your way up and, and ask. But happy to meet you, chat, and if we can be of help to you, it would be our joy. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it.